This is Italy in 1859. This is Italy in 1861. Rome was taken from the Pope in 1870. Because of such a quick unification, Italians felt more loyal to their individual provinces rather than the nation as a whole. One of the biggest divisions in Italy was the North-South Divide. Under Francesco Nitti, the North were balling hard. We're talking about car industry, steel and iron production increasing significantly, and the Industrial Triangle, the richest and most industrialised area in Italy. Meanwhile, the South was much more poor and agricultural based. Giolitti was elected as Prime Minister for the fourth time on the 30th of March 1911. He had beef with three major groups, the Church, the Socialists and the Nationalists. The Church disliked the government as the state took power away from the Pope, and in 1870 Rome had been finessed, leaving just the Vatican City under the Pope's direct control. The opposition of the Church to recognise the nation of Italy was known as the Roman Question. The Socialists posed a threat to the success of the Liberal Union, so Giolitti offered many concessions and absorbed the key Socialist leaders into his squad. The PSI, the Italian Socialist Party, had gained a lot of support since its founding in 1892 by Filippo Turati. The Nationalists were not as easy to tame as the Socialists. They wanted Italy to be seen by the world as a great power and hated the weakness of the Liberal government. The Nationalists also wanted to expand Italy's empire and reform the Irredenta. They formed under a legitimate political party in 1910 called the ANI, making them pose an even bigger threat to Giolitti and his Liberal Union. Instead of siding with a particular ideology or group, Giolitti used and mastered the art of transformismo, which was to form coalitions with different parties on opposite ends of the political spectrum, bringing them together into a centrist union. He would give parties what they wanted in order to keep them happy, but the very next day he would straight up Logan Paul savage them by giving into a party that had a completely opposite goal. In an effort to appease the nationalists and a desire to expand Italy's empire, Giolitti went peace mode and invaded Ottoman and Libya on the 29th of September 1911. Italy seized most of the ports and naval towns just three weeks into the campaign. However, following this success, Italy got caught lurking as they became stuck in battles with both sides suffering casualties. As progress began to halt, Giolitti decided to invade and occupy 13 Ottoman-owned islands in the Aegean Sea. Sure, there's the Apollo uh, sneaky on you. This gave them a great strategic advantage and great propaganda. With the Balkan Wars kicking off, the Ottomans chose to surrender Libya to Italy. Peace was declared on the 18th of October 1912 and 3,500 Italians had died in the war. The war was redemption for unfortunate events in Ethiopia, and Giolitti expected to return to Italy as a top dog alpha male. Unfortunately for him, this was not the case as the ANI took most of the credit for the victory, and said Giolitti had only gone to war because of their influence. The war had destroyed his relationship with the socialists, as he had violated them by declaring war and sending young lower class men to their deaths. I am fuming mega mega fuming! By sending these young, mostly illiterate men to fight in Libya, it was hard for Giolitti to deny them a vote. So in 1912, Giolitti made it so the restrictions on who could vote were much more lenient, saying that any male over the age of 30 or he who had served in the military had the right to vote. Previously, only 25% of men had this privilege. Giolitti thought that this would make him popular to the lower class, but he was wrong. In the 1913 elections, the Liberal Union lost support to the PSI and ANI. They still managed to stay in power, but it was clear that those who had gained the ability to vote through Giolitti's voting reforms had used their newfound power to vote for parties who were stronger and had policies that matched their voters' desires. Congratulations, you played yourself. Such as the appeal of the PSI to the lower class workers. As politics became more radical and opposition to his style of government grew, Giolitti's transformismo had become ineffective. The PSI had become stronger by kicking out leaders who were weak and cooperative with the Liberal government. Because of the rise of radicalism, it was too difficult for Giolitti to force cooperation, and on the 21st of March 1914, he resigned and appointed Salandra as his successor. Although, Giolitti's influence would remain for some time. His reforms, which tried to absorb the lower class away from the socialism and into the Liberal Union, would lead to protests from the public. Although these protests did little to influence the government, what followed after three of them were shot by authorities would be known as Red Week. Red Week took place in Romagna and Maishe in June 1914 and involved a week of radical violence and vandalism. Although it was planned by the PSI to be peaceful striking, it quickly became more aggressive and uncivilised as they lost control. Many workers would be killed by authorities putting down the rioters. The unrest ended when trade unions finally agreed to call off the striking. 
However, Salandra's biggest crisis would come on July 28th as Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, leading to World War I. Italy had signed a triple alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary in 1882. However, they did not have to get involved as Austria-Hungary had not consulted with them before declaring war on Serbia. Oh shit! Oh shit! No! Italy took advantage of this loophole and declared neutrality. This declaration threw Italy into chaos. Politics was split between interventionists and those who wanted to remain neutral. Although it was a heated topic in Italy with no final decision being made, the dynamic duo Solandro and Sonia began secret talks with both the Central Powers and Entente as to who would give them more if Italy was to join on their side. Austria held ends Italy greatly desired, such as South Tyrol, and the Entente promised that Italy would receive these if they won the war. Convincing the king that civil war would break out if Italy did not make a decision soon, the Treaty of London was signed on April 26, 1915, between the Italians and Entente powers, and on May 25th, Italy declared war on Austria-Hungary. Many Italians stopped betrayed by this decision, as Salandra had not consulted the army, parliament or people before joining the war. The southern front became known as the White War due to how freezing fighting conditions were in the Alps. Salandra hoped that the war would open a new front in which the Entente would be able to quickly break through and win the war. However, shortly after the declaration of war, unlike the West and East, the Southern Front became locked in trench warfare. The majority of the 5 million conscripts were lower class peasants, making communication between the Northern generals and Southern fighters hard due to how different the dialects were across Italy. During Supreme Commander Luigi Cadorna's leadership of the military, morale was often low and many lives would be lost in seemingly pointless battles. After a string of defeats and opposition to his leadership, Salandra resigns, allowing Boselli to take command as Prime Minister. After the Straff expedition, it had become obvious to the Italian population that the war was not going to be the quick fight that Salandra had promised, but the most devastating defeat came at the Battle of Caporetto. Lasting from the 24th of October 1917, to the 29th of November. It was also known as the 12th Battle of the Isonzo, which had been an ongoing conflict with the Isonzo River since the start of the war. The battle was seen as the most devastating defeat the Italian army had ever suffered, and led to the forced resignation of Luigi Cadorna, who was replaced by the much more lenient and tactical leader Armando Diaz. 10,000 troops were killed, 600,000 lost contact in the humiliating and chaotic retreat, and 265,000 troops were taken prisoner. Italian prisoners of war were forgotten by the government, leaving 100,000 of the 600,000 to starve to death in the camps. Unlike the other Entente powers, Italy didn't supply food parcels, and by the end of the war, the Liberal government had made an enemy with the veterans they had abandoned. After the humiliating defeat of Caporetto, Bostelli rage quits, allowing Orlando to take control as Prime Minister, who works with Diaz to raise morale in the army. Orlando promises land reforms and workers' rights to keep the Italians fighting. He also establishes an organisation to look out for the soldiers' families while they were away fighting. The Battle of Caporetto led to those who opposed the war to be dealt with more severely. Mussolini saw those who opposed the war as just as much of a threat as the Central Powers were. They were blamed for the low morale of the Italian troops. Mussolini had started 1914 strongly against Italy's intervention in the war along with the Socialists and Catholics. However, he began to show support, considering it to be the only way to spark a revolution in Italy and end the Liberal government. He was even arrested during a pro-war protest. He was excluded from the PSI and socialist groups for these interventionist beliefs. In retaliation, he began to publish Il Popolo d'Italia in November 1915, a pro-war newspaper that would continue to run until the 24th of July in 1943. The threat of opposition to the war was shown in 1917 when 50 workers were killed in riots during the insurrection for peace and bread in Turin. Politicians quickly gave in to the protests by giving the lower class more rations and increasing pro-war propaganda. This event was used by the interventionists to show how those against the war were harming the war effort. By 1918, Italy's economy had become a lot more adaptive for war. Thanks to the work of Alfred Dariolo, Italy had been able to produce more arms and ammunition while making contracts with companies and taking out foreign loans. His work expanded the economy of the north and arms production companies prospered. However, as the industrialists got richer, the real wages of the workers fell. All the money dedicated by the government to the arms meant that the agricultural economy of the south was neglected. Because of the improved economy, Orlando felt comfortable to exact vengeance for Caporetto with Entente support in the Battle of Vittoria Veneto. After the spring offensive, 
Orlando thought that the war may soon be over and Italy needed to gain land for power at the peace conference. The Germans living on the southern front made it vulnerable to an offensive. With the boys backing them, the Italian army charged into Austria-Hungary occupied Veneto across the Piave River and regained land lost in the Battle of Caporetto. The battle was seen as Italy's greatest achievement in World War I and with the use of propaganda to show the power of the Italian army. It was hoped that this battle would bring Italy a lot of power and respect in the peace conference, but it did little to further their position. The war ended on the 11th of November 1918. 650,000 Italian soldiers had been killed, and the war's legacy would live on for many years, and those who opposed and rebelled against it would not be forgotten.